I imagine myself wriggling my butt, rotating my shoulders and neck, adjusting my position as I sat back and contemplated life. Can you all imagine it? I'm sure, I'm sure you could imagine yourself on this bus, right? Your own bus. The ride had been mostly good so far, some bumps along the way, but mostly good, right? I, I'm a award-winning company, right? Everybody's shaking their head, wrong. My company was a growing success, but I was stuck in a rut and had been stuck for a while. Ever get that feeling where you're just stuck, you're not moving anywhere? This is where I am. The breakdown of my marriage, as painful as it was, showed me it was time to stop pretending that my life was the way I wanted it to be. I imagined, my, I imagined myself anxiously walking to the front of the bus as I cautiously stepped down and onto the shoulders, eyes adjusting to the brightness outside. I noticed a few things. The most obvious, the windows of my bus were not tinted. They were grimed over with detritus from my past. All the lies, the grief, the mistakes I thought I'd moved on from were still hanging on like old baggage. I needed to clean that bus, but it was impossible to do that all by myself. There was way too much stuff. Counseling had helped me see that I had survived the difficult stuff in my life. Now it was time to tackle the hurts one by one, release the pain and strip away the barriers to my future. When I saw it clearly, the whole bus was in rough shape. It needed a complete engine overhaul. The sound I thought was road hiss was air leaving the tires. All of them were flat and looked like they had been that way for a while. All this time, all this effort, and I hadn't even been moving. Worse, there were other buses passing me by, opportunities I'd been ignoring while I was stuck in my rut of pride and pain, hanging on to my dirty baggage. I had been so comfortable on my dilapidated bus, sitting idly, thinking I was moving along. I was not living with passion or purpose. I was existing to land the next client, collect the next check, and go on another family vacation that I did not enjoy because I remained so plugged into work. I needed help not only to deal with my past, but to figure out how to be more present, stop merely existing, and start living my life. So in December of 2013, September of 2013, I enroll in an executive MBA program. I'm thinking, look, I know things are going okay, but I want the next adventure. I want to live with passion and purpose. So I'm, I'm looking at two options at this point. I'm going to take the company global, or I'm going to leave the company and go into private corporate life. Still, no politics. What happens when I'm in this executive MBA course? There's a politics component. The first politics course I've ever taken in my life. And in this course, the professor talks about political capital and how people in politics are able to help businesses achieve some of their goals. The company that I worked for, that I owned, Resolve Research Solution, was a healthcare-based research management firm. We ran clinical trials, much like you're seeing now with this vaccine, I would run those clinical trials, but I was also running a national epidemiology study on neurological conditions, looking at the scope, impact, health services, and risk factors for diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and epilepsy across the age continuum. And what I was finding was that individuals, we were hearing from people who had to move from their province. So move from Ontario to Alberta or to another province, because their medications weren't covered by one provincial formulary or another, or they'd have to divorce and in order to get the services covered for their Parkinson's or their dementia. And I thought, aha, this is where I could go next. So that was in December of 2013. In February of 2014, I decide, I'll become a member of a political party for the first time in my life. I'd always voted liberal. So I decided I'd become a member of the liberal party. Of course, once you click join, they send you a lot of emails. And on March 8th, 
2014 International Women's Day, I got an email that said, invite her to run. Do you know a woman who would be interested in running in the next federal election? And I said, uh-huh, me. And the rest is history. So of course, everybody knows that I lost the by-election. I enter politics bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in 2016. In 2017, I'm searching for my purpose because you know I, I heard Barack Obama speak and um, he talked about the ability to, to, uh, of leaders to not only vote on legislation and regulation, but also it was important for leaders to bend the status quo, to raise awareness and to shape culture. And I'm searching for my purpose in 2017. And then in 2018, it clicks. My passion is people. So that September 2017 speech with my braids in my hair talking about those braids, that was an intentional moment where I realized that I need to be talking about these things that are often whispered about. I need to be amplifying those voices of people who are often silenced or marginalized by the political infrastructure. I need it, if, response, if representation matters, then I needed to talk about what matters to the people that I represent. So I started to talk more about mental health and about equity, about justice. I started to just really be a lot more vocal about things that I knew people were not talking about in my government. That came with a lot of consequences. But remember what the, the definition of transformative leadership that I gave you at the beginning. You still have to allow your values to guide what you do next. And by the time I left parliament, I sat as an independent. And so what do transformative leaders do? Transformative leaders, even after I leave politics, we don't stop advocating. We don't stop breaking glass ceilings. And let's be clear, when you break glass ceilings, if you're closest to it, the glass is gonna fall somewhere and you're gonna get cut. That is for sure. And we don't need to look to the MVP in the United States, the Madame Vice, Vice President Kamala Harris to see what black female leadership looks like in Black History Month. We have a leader of a federal party, Adam A. Paul, who is the leader of the Green Party here in Canada. But I really want you to pay attention to this woman here. And I'm, I'm sure this woman could represent a lot of people, um, Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams lost an election and she is what I believe the personification of transformative leadership is, where she takes that loss, that pain, that hurt, that moment in her life where she says, I can't believe this is happening to me. And she uses that moment. She transforms that moment into one of the most powerful episodes of democracy we've seen in our modern times, where she's flipped a state of Georgia to the democratic vote. It was, I get goosebumps, I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about how you take that pain of hurt and use it for good. And when I think about my story and I think about what I write in, in Can You Hear Me Now, all of my pains and mistakes and every, all of my shame is in this book. When I think about that, I think about the fact that that pain and hurt and shame that you feel is tied together with your happiness, your strength, your resilience, your determination, and all of those lessons create value in you, create value. And therefore, if you understand that value, you are an asset to every organization, institution, conversation, or policy that you develop or are a part of. This is what Stacey Abrams did. She took that pain and made it her purpose. She took that messy, and made it her message. She took all of that hurt and made it her purpose. And so transformative leaders use that and take that and, and make it better for the greater good, not necessarily for themselves. And so why is this important, Selena? Why are you telling me all this stuff? Because you know what? The two things that I'm most passionate about are equity and mental health. You will always see me talking about one of these two things, always. 
Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, why don't you advocate for, for this or that or the other? Child, because I've learned how to say no. That's why <laughs> I stay in the lane of which I'm most passionate about. And so when we think about microaggressions, the American Psychological Association in 2018 said that microaggressions, those daily acts of death by a thousand cut racism causes trauma. They did, the American Psychological Association did not say that microaggressions cause pain. They didn't say that it caused hurt. They didn't say they caused general unwellness or malaise. They said it caused trauma. So whether you're talking about death by a thousand cuts racism or swift blunt force use n-word against someone racism it all causes this trauma and i often think about the fact that people continue to do this unconscious bias training how long is your bias going to remain unconscious before it's just blatant willful ignorance we really need to check ourselves on some of these things that we call unbiased or micro Right? We need to be clear about what that does, how they further create inequity instead of creating equity, and how they impact people's mental health. But let's look at a little bit of a more salient topic when we think about uh, COVID-19. This is data from the City of Toronto. And the City of Toronto is made up of 52% people who are racialized, yet they the impact of COVID-19 on that group is 80%. 80% of the impact of COVID-19 falls on racialized people. The Black community in Toronto makes up only 9% of the population, but up to third, at the highest point, 30% of the impact of COVID-19, 25% of hospitalizations. This, this what we're talking, this in a, inequity in this system is not just causing a mental health strain. People are dying. People are dying. And, you know, I really got to give kudos to John Tory, the mayor of Toronto, for deciding that they were actually going to collect race-based data because the province of Ontario also had a choice in April of 2020, at the same time that Toronto did in April of 2020, to make a decision that was either anti-racist or racist. And if anybody hasn't read the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, I suggest that you do, because they both had a choice to make. They had a choice whether they were gonna create equity in their system or they were gonna create inequity, because they were hearing news from the United States that, COVID-19 was disproportionately impacting Black people. And they had a choice to say, well, we are going to do something about it. We are going to ensure that that does not create any further inequity. And we are going to therefore collect race-based data. We're going to see where the pain points are. The chief medical officer in Ontario said COVID-19 does not discriminate and made the decision to further create inequity by not collecting race-based data. The city of Toronto said clearly COVID-19 does, maybe the disease doesn't, but how the other social determinants of health do. So we will collect race-based data, create equity in this system and make an anti-racist choice to act and to see where the pain point pain points are, and clearly we could see now where we need to put additional resources in the system. It's just that simple. This is not an academic exercise. This is about creating equity or not creating in, or creating inequity. The last thing that I'll, uh, I'll talk about in, in terms of things that I'm, I'm passionate about before I get into why this is so important is systemic racism. And, you know, We've heard a, a number of different individuals talk about the fact that they, they can't define systemic racism. They don't know what systemic racism means. They, they don't know how, um, how to define it in any way, shape, or form. This picture here is from the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies. 
I, 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 it's small on here. I really want people to, to take the time to Google this picture and see for yourself. This is not Selena talking about this data. This is not Selena says, this is the information that's being provided um, by the, the Ontario Associations of Children's Aid Societies. And one of the things that you'll see in this picture is that 40% of the children in Children's Aid Society in Toronto, are black children, 40%. Again, remember the black population only makes up 9% of the city of Toronto. And yet 40% of the children are, are black children. And when you look at their points of entry, their points of staying in the system and their points of exiting the system, you will notice that they are disproportionately impacted by racism that is embedded within the system. So they're brought into the system at a, at a five times higher rate. They are kept within the system. And instead of being returned home to their families, what ends up happening as, as white children are more, more of the white children are returned to their families. You see a lot of the black children are aged out of the system, meaning they likely don't graduate. They likely end up in the criminal punishment system, or they um, have you know, um, pregnancy, early pregnancies. This is the same kind of thing that you see within our justice system. 8% of the population is Indigenous, 25% of federal, federal uh, prison population is Indigenous, 3.5% of the Canadian population is Black, about 10% of the population of prisons is Black individuals. And this is not because we're, black, we're bad people. So, you know, the, the thought could be, well, if you're doing bad things, that is what's going to happen. But again, I'll ask you to look at the Globe and Mail report that was done in the last couple of months that looked that was entitled Biases Within the Prison System. And when you when they accounted for the variables in the research, they found that embedded in our justice system, a system that is supposed to create justice we had racism that was accounting for this overrepresentation, accounting for this disproportionate number of individuals um, within the, the federal prison system. So one last reading before I close out on here. Um, actually, let me do this one first before I go back to the reading. So why is all of this important? It is really important because the world needs all of us to show up. The world needs us at this moment. 2020 was not just a year of historical events. 2020 was a call to action. 2020 was the moment when we stopped saying we are non-racist, we are non-sexist, we are non-discriminatory, and started saying we are anti-racist, we are anti-sexist, we are anti-homophobic, we are anti-ableism, we are anti-discriminatory. It means that we're acting. And in Derek Bell's book, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, this is another one of my favorite books. You'd think that one of my favorite books would have been my own, but... <laughs> But Derek Bell faces at the bottom of the well. He says in this book, when he describes Martin Luther King and Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Remember Martin Luther King Jr. had death threats. His house was bombed. He was like jailed, all kinds of stuff. Yet the part of the struggle that Dr. 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 King had towards civil rights, part of that struggle was the need to speak the truth as he, Dr. Q, King, viewed it, even when that truth alienated rather than unified, upset minds or upset people rather than calm their hearts and subjected the speaker to general censure rather than acclaim. Meaning that most of the time when he was doing what he was doing, he knew full well that he would be alone walking that road. But as long as he was on the right side of history, as long as we stand up on the right side of history, that is the place that we want to be. That is what transformative leaders do. That, that in spite of the challenges that they're facing in speaking the truth, in spite of how people react, 
they still do it anyway. And so this is from the conclusion of my book. Can you hear me now? The last truth I came to is that my journey does not have a destination. Well, except for the final one. There is no achieving an ultimate state of authenticity any more than there is a final destination called becoming a leader. When you define yourself as the leader, you inevitably begin to defend your position as if there is no other option, worried that if you respond flexibly to the demands of the day, people may call you inconsistent. The fallacy of believing that you have arrived at leadership or authenticity is that you risk turning away from the opportunity to learn in the moment, to manage your position or your reaction to any given, to a given situation. Many who have witnessed me trying my best to speak and act from an authentic place have asked me if being authentic works in business or in politics. That is a difficult question to answer because authenticity is a struggle. But don't get me wrong. It is not a struggle because I don't know how to be authentic. That I do know. It is a struggle because authenticity is just as multifaceted as the idea of leadership. I can't always be singing from the one note. I need to take different approaches to the different situations and challenges that arise. So do we all. Some situations require us to be silent. Sometimes we need to speak audibly and clearly. Other times we are required to shout and take it to the streets. And so transformative leadership requires us to keep going, requires us to be our 100% authentic self. Remember Stacey Abrams, she took the pain, she took the hurt, she took the, the mistakes and she added them to her strength, her joys, her resilience to create the authentic person that she was, that was able to take that lesson and transform it. So what do we do from here? Where do we go from here? Number one, stories are sticky. Tell yours. It is so important as we start to think about how we create racial equity in places that we not only want people to, to hear stories, we need to listen to them. But people can only listen to your story if you tell it. And you can't be afraid and hold it so close to your insides that you're not able to help people through your own story. I'm sure if Stacey Abrams wanted to, she could have buried that loss so deep inside and gone about her business. But she took that story and told it and inspired people by it and allowed something magical to happen. Number part B, live authentically. All of your experiences add value, like I just said. And that value, therefore, if you know how much it is, if you take the time to understand your value, your worth, you will always know when to walk away from a situation. You will always know that if you, that you are an asset to any organization, institution, school, conversation, policy development, and for our young people, now listen up now, relationship that you are in. So this is not just about a job. This is about putting your valuable self in a relationship. You are an asset to that relationship. And therefore, if the person on the other side of that relationship, job, conversation, policy, whatever, is not giving you a positive return on your investment of time, love, resources, and energy, guess what you got to do? It might be time to, yes, to cut it, cut it, cut it. <laughs> to cut it. Um, it might be time to say bye, right? It might be time to walk away. And that is very, very difficult to do. But when you understand how valuable you are, you cannot continue to take a, a negative return on all this loveliness of an investment. Come on now, right? Next, 
leadership does not require a title. So you might be thinking, well, Selena, you are the parliamentary secretary. It's easier for you. No, it's not easier for me. Clearly, I'm not there anymore, right? In fact, it may be harder the higher up you go. Leadership does not require a title and your value has never been determined by a title. Transformative leaders understand their own value, their own abilities, their own strengths, the, the, how they work as an asset to any organization or institution. In fact, when you think about the last two reports that McKinsey put out, in 2019, McKinsey and company put out a report about the cost of racial inequity to the United States of America. It will cost one to $1.5 billion by 2028. 6% of their GDP. When they did another report about women and giving them the tools to reach their full potential globally, when women get the tools to reach their full potential, they would add 28 trillion, trillion, I don't even know how many zeros that is, trillion dollars to the global GDP. This, these are the people that don't have a title. These are the people that people talk about as the minorities. These are the individuals that when I tell you, you are valuable, your value is that $1.5 billion. Your value is that $28 trillion. Now, if you enter into those spaces and you don't show up as your authentic self, guess what you're doing to that value? Diminishing it. And when you show up in spaces and they don't value you, those organizations are at a loss. That's not your loss. That's their loss. They've lost out on that $1.5 billion. They've lost out on that $28 trillion. And lastly, and I think most importantly, open yourself up to the universe of possibilities. I don't think that I would have been here right now talking as a former politician if I had paid attention to that roadmap and not looked, like I said, on the bus, not looked at the opportunities passing me by. Because remember, I only had two options, take the company global or go private. I opened myself up to the opportunity of politics. And here I am. And I'll end it there for now and turn it over to Rebecca to see if there's any questions. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your presentation. There were so many tidbits that were such relatable content. You know, myself also being like an immigrant, children of immigrants, you only have very limited career options from the perspective of your parents and from your community. Um, and I think more valuably, you talked about you know, where there were moments where you were down, you know, down but not out, mm -hmm. and how you use that as opportunities for success. And I think that's a very important message um, to give to everyone. But I'm thinking to this audience, specifically young people who are navigating their way, who sometimes face failure, and it might be one of the first times they face real failure, and they're not sure what to do or how to handle it. So I think that message in particular is so important and resounding. So Rebecca, you know what? I remember making those mistakes and it wasn't until like this part of my life and I'm 46 years old. I was like, man, why didn't anybody tell me that? So I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I wrote a book about every single mistake I've ever made is in this book. And I wrote about every single one because I want people to like, look at it and go, oh, that's what she did. Okay. Okay. All right. Oh, oh, that's what she did. Oof. I won't do that. Right. Or man, did you see how many mistakes Selena made? My life is good. <laughs> it's like, it's like a barometer for. <laughs> yeah. It's so great. And I, I can, what, what was your children's reaction to that? Were they like, ah, uh... yeah. So somebody asked me that before they were like, oh, are your children? Like, you know, did they, did they do all that stuff that you did? I was like, all this stuff that I did, if my children even dared try, I'd see it coming from a mile away. They can't get away with nothing with me. I've done it all, right? But it's interesting because we are very open. Like we have very open conversations in our house about everything. And so um, when the book came out, we, we, they were reading it as I was publishing. But when it came out, we all like got our own copies and we read it. And we have dinner together as a family every single night. Every night we have dinner together. And so um, one night, so the, the day the book comes in, 
We're calling my 21 year old Desiree, Desiree, come up for dinner, Desiree. She's like, oh, hold on, I'm reading the book. I'm like, dude, you know how it ends. Like, come up for dinner. And she comes up and she's like, man, I hope Selena and Vidal make it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, me and your dad are still here. We make it. And she said, you know, it was like reading the backstory of her life. Oh yeah. That would make so much sense. Like, yeah. Cause, and I, I struggle with this too. Um, she's known you her whole life, but you've right. known her for 21 of your own years. Yes. Yes. And so when she said that, it was like a, it was a an aha moment. But then we had like, we're, we're having the dinner conversation now. And she's like, so, you know, and it was a few weeks, a, a, a few days later. And then my other daughter has read the book. My son hasn't read the book yet. And so they're like, so, cause we have these things called DCs, dinner conversations. We always pick a topic. And so they're like, so, why are you and daddy still together? I'm like, oh my God, pass the <laughs> Pass the mashed potatoes. <laughs> and I mean, it's awkward conversations that we have, but I think in our, our families, we need to, there's certain things that I felt like I wasn't prepared for in growing up. Like I wasn't prepared for certain things because I think our parents, as hard as they are on us, they try to protect us from some of the bad stuff at the same time. And it's like, oh, oh, you mean so people actually do get divorced? okay, but what if I don't want to do that? Like, what do I do then? Yeah. Right. And so we had that kind of conversation. We have conversations about miscarriages and we have conversations about all kinds of stuff, right. That's, that's in the book. And I'm like, any, do you have any other questions? And I'm always like, please say no, please say no, please say no. <laughs> but it's, but it's fun because we need to be able to to, to give our kids a different set of tools to navigate this world that my parents obviously gave me to navigate the world that they knew. Mm -hmm. No, that's so, that's so true. And I agree with that. And I think it fosters better conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to transition now into some of our audience questions. I know we're getting a bunch. And so the first question that we've received is from uh, Warren Kelsey. And so he asks, um, and you, you touched on this a bit during your presentation and you certainly discussed this a lot in your book, um, but his question is, how has systemic racism impacted your personal and professional decision-making? Wow, so, you know, um, it's been, it, so chapter 10 in my book, um, when it was published, I said like, I wanted to just tear out the whole chapter because um, it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. And somebody, I was doing an interview today and somebody said, it seemed like you didn't know, like it seemed like you were, you were surprised by it. Mm -hmm. And I said, I was, I was surprised that it existed. I was surprised that, you know, my title like, do you know who it I am? Like, it didn't, yeah, it didn't act as a barrier. It didn't shield me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, but I'm the parliamentary secretary. Like, you can't. What? And mm -hmm. it didn't protect me. So I almost felt like chapter 10, I was like, what? What's happening? I don't know. Like, I was falling apart. And I'm like, who have grow up? You're like, you're a grown woman. Like, come on, you know what this is. Mm -hmm. And it still was, it was still shocking me what was happening happening. And I kept it in the book because I wanted people to feel like it's okay to feel that way. Yeah. That's why they call, that's why they describe it as the insidiousness of racism, where it creeps into the crevices of your mind and you, it plays these games with you to the point where you, you're not really sure if what you're feeling is what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then how you deal with that after. Um, it, it, it left me feeling embarrassed that I, I didn't name it the way that I should have, mm -hmm. um, but I left that in the book because I want people to know that your title doesn't protect you. Yeah. Um, and my, in terms of my profession, so personally, um, so that was professionally, and I think personally, I think that the the challenges that I had with my mental health, and I describe it in the book. I say, you know, was it the was I was I, was it my mental, was it my depression that was causing me to feel this way or was racism the kryptonite yeah. 
that caused me to feel this way, right? So you, you still, I think that was in chapter 10 too, you still don't quite know. You're in this like weird blurry place. Mm-hmm. And I found myself constantly falling back to maybe I'm actually going crazy. Maybe I'm going crazy. Like, oh my God, I need to call my psychiatrist. Like I actually, I mean, I do deal with depression, but the way I have, like what the way my depression manifests now is not the same as it did when I was in politics. Mm-hmm. Now I take my medication and I'm, I'm relatively chill. I do my med my meditation, my yoga, my, my stuff to keep myself healthy. This isn't the constant, like looking over your shoulder, like my spidey senses are tickling. What's yeah. happening. That's a different situation. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like in terms of my professional and my personal life, I, I can now differentiate quite clearly when racism or sexism or massage noir as Moya Bailey famously yeah. termed it is happening and then how I deal with it. So that was chapter 10. By the time I got to chapter 13, girl, it was a whole different beast at that point. By that point, I was like, oh, hell no, we are not doing this again. Like, I know exactly what is happening right now. I know misogyny when I see it. And I know misogyny noir when I see it. So the conversation that I had in chapter 13, um, I don't care what your title is. You are not speaking to me that way. In fact, let's be clear. As a professional, I represent 130,000 people. I am the member of parliament for Whitby. And if you dare spoke to any one of my people that I represent like that, mm-hmm. you will get cut up the same way. Yeah. And it was an example. I think I think I wrote the book because I I also want history to record my story of what was what it was like while I was there or what I was like when I was here. And so I want people to know as an example, first of all, usually women with multiple intersecting identities, women of color, people with disabilities, different sexual orientation, religious, whatever. I want them to know, no, you do not have to accept that behavior. Mm -mm. Not when you say not today, like mean not today, not today, not today. And, and, and if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have been able to look myself in the eye, just, you know, put my tail between my legs and swallow. Nah, no, not today. We were at a not today moment. I was not the same person in chapter 10 that I was in chapter 13. Mm-hmm. And I think the way that you describe the microaggressions, the racism, the misogynoir, misogyny, I think it's so important the way that you just described it. Um, a lot of, so I'm, I'm talking from a student perspective, a lot of students experienced racism. Um, you know, post-secondary, in university for for our purposes, for our context. And they often feel like, similar to what you were feeling in in chapter 10, that that it's all in their head, that they're not like, it's, I don't know, it kind of didn't feel good, my stomach isn't feeling great, but can I really call this what I think it is and like the, the confirmation. So I think the way that you you lay it laid it out and the way you lay it out now, I think it's it's almost the most common experience of racism among among people of color, among black people. And and then remember the slide. Remember the and I feel like I need to put a poster on a billboard all along the 401 or something that says microaggressions or everyday racism causes trauma. Yeah. Trauma. So you have poor health, physical health outcomes, poor mental health outcomes. And if you want to talk about these spiritually just dampening, those are, that's the thing that you really need to think about. And so weaving it into conversations about COVID-19 around, you know, the things that are happening in systems, it's not that the blunt force trauma that, that that's not the only way we, we are killed. We're or putting a knee in our necks. That's not the only way. It's how every day, what you do every single day to to create inequity, to bring us to not have a sense of belonging in your institution or your school or your workplace causes that same death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, So we have uh, another question coming in here, a few questions. So I'll try to make sure I allocate enough time. Um, So the 
question is from an anonymous audience member and it says in hindsight what would you do differently regarding politics and or becoming an entrepreneur huh spicy i know i <laughs> um so so i'll answer the entrepreneur question first because that's a different story that i don't mind sharing a little bit and spoiling that part of the book a little bit because as an entrepreneur, again, I worked in a healthcare or a health research sector and specifically in brain research. And that area is very white male dominated. I knew, and it was older males, right? Yeah. They're the gods of the, the yeah. world, right? As you neurologists, <laughs> you mess with any other part, somebody could survive, but you mess with the brain, <laughs> the final frontier. They're so awesome. Um, I had the time of my life working in that company. Um, but for the first few years, until maybe after 2007, when I won the Harry Jerome Award, maybe even a little bit after that, because people knew about the Harry Jerome Award, but not like the Toronto Board of Trade Award. Like they knew about it, but not really knew about it. Yeah. Um, I didn't put my face or my name on any material. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I, I was not going to deal with someone saying to me, I don't want to work with her because she's black she, or mm -hmm. she it's, it's a woman or she's young. Yeah. I, I don't want to work with, I don't want to deal with that. So I just thought, you know what? My ego is totally in check. I don't need to put my face on anything. Mm -hmm. So I intentionally did not do that because I just didn't, I just didn't want to have to deal with that kind of hassle. And it wasn't until the contracts were fully signed and we were both starting to make money that I would show up at spaces. And oftentimes I'd show up and, you know, I get shooed aside and I'd be like, oh, my, I'm my me. We, I'm making my money, whether you see me now or you see me in an hour, I'm just going to sit right here and chill. And then, you know, one guy came out and he's like, where's my 11 o'clock? They're late. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm right here. And his face was kind of like, and it was that humility in that moment, but it was also that grace. Like, you know, when you walk up and that, like, you feel like you have this air around you, yeah. like it's where you stand in your power without having to exert any power, uh -huh. you know, when you just yeah. walk in grace and you're just like, this is the moment that I was trying to like manage by not putting my face, this is okay now let's go now that now that the shock and awe is over let's go so would I do anything differently there absolutely not I just don't think it's worth it and I I won't want to see you know when we think about research done by Marianne Bertrand who's an economist she says that 50 percent of resumes with ethnic sounding names don't even get an interview that's right yeah right when they when they change their names and and make it more um make it anglicized. more anglicized yeah mm -hmm. then the person the it, the interview times or recallbacks increase mm -hmm. and there is a perceived eight years of additional experience perceived <laughs> eight years so a name change gives you eight added years of so when they say things like well if you have two resumes side by side one black one white you know you you don't they're, they're exactly the same who will get the job well mm -hmm. when those people show up the person who has the anglicized name the the usually the white person gets that perceived eight years of extra experience yeah so perceived competence right mm -hmm. and so I won't change I won't change what I did there because it, it protected me from some of that stuff. It's not the same, but it protected me. In politics, what I've done differently, I talk about it in the book, mm -hmm. is that I would have not been so obsessed with the fact that I was the only Black woman in Parliament. Yeah, yeah you take a breath. It's, it's hard, though. Right, and it was like, I was the only, not the only one out of the majority government, including opposition, everybody out of 338 people. And, and we know that as black women in particular, women of color, every single thing we do is political. So yeah. I show up one day with braids. What you got braids for? Why are you wearing dresses with those big sleeves? 
So then you try to fit in, right? So you wear black and you like try to keep yourself, you know, keep my hair in a nice little bob. And then you, you know, you don't put too much makeup on and you try to just kind of blend in. And then you're just like, no, I don't do blend in very well. So you walk in with the big sleeves and every day is a conversation. And one day my hair is like shaved off. The next day it's like, like, it's like this. So where, which, which, which Selena showing up today? The hair, the no hair, the braids. What was Selena showing up? And I remember my staff saying to me, you know, um, no, you can't do that. You can't change your hair. Like you have to keep your hair the same. How would you people know? How would your constituents know who you are? I said, well, I'm a black woman. We change our hair every week. Yeah. <laughs> we <either> buy it, <laughs> we, so we weave it in or we cut it off. I said, you know what? This space wasn't designed for me. So I'm going to make sure that I, that I am myself in it. But I wish I didn't obsess about it so much. I wish I, I understood that I was, while I was the only one in politics, I wasn't the only black woman in a, in a senior level position. And I should have connected with those individuals in banking or in tech or whatever. I should have done that a little bit more, mm -hmm. but there's always so much capacity to think about things in the moment, right? Yes. And, and, and in the moment, I did have a few people that I reached out to for guidance around particular legislation. Um, but I wish I was, I made more of a circle of sisters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so true, even, even what you're saying. Um, and I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that, uh, that you did change your hair as much as you, as you say you did. Um, because when I think of women, black women, especially in politics, like if I think of Kamala Harris or I think of Michelle Obama, I, you know, especially with Michelle Obama, she made a point to not change her hair drastically or to wear it naturally or to wear protective styles because she knew it would be a point of conversation. We didn't see her with curly hair until the end of the eight years. Yeah, I did that throughout the whole time. And I, I kept running out of hairstyles. So I shaved one side and I shaved more. I was like, oh my gosh, how much hair do I have? I was like, this thing needs to grow back faster. <laughs> No, that's, that's so true. And I think it's so like that those are such relatable struggles, you know, um, and thinking if there are any other people of color or black women that are on this call, these are things that most people don't really think about or have to worry about that are that we focus on so much because we already understand that we're in a space that that doesn't have anyone else that looks like us. Right. So there's not that same normalcy. It's, and so we, that's, that's where the microaggressions come in, right? That's where we're, we're constantly. So if, if someone were to touch a woman's leg and squeeze her leg, you know, that's assaults. Like we, we immediately know what to do with that. We go, in. but when somebody's like, oh, Selena, your hair was so short yesterday and look at these long braids and they start like running their hand, which is what happened, right. running their fingers through my hair. And it's, excuse me. Oh, I was just, I just thought it, you know, I was just wanting it's to, cool. it, was, mm -hmm. it was cool. I just wanted to, why are you being so sensitive? Why are you getting so angry? What, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're mad at me. You ran your dirty hands through my hair and now you want to be mad at me for that? But there, most institutions don't have a process for reporting mm -hmm. that kind of behavior. Yeah. But when we talk about racism, when we talk about microaggressions, we have to also be talking about accountability. What happens with that? How do we how do we curb that behavior? As we know exactly what to do when some man touches a, a woman's leg, and I hate to gentrify it, but if a man were to touch and squeeze a woman's leg, you'll know exactly what to do, what the consequences are, and the consequences have then curbed that behavior. How do you curb the behavior of microaggressions? And this is the conversations we should be having. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question from another anonymous audience member is, what guidance would you offer to a person of African descent who is considering pursuing a political and or entrepreneurial career? Um, I would tell you to consider the entrepreneurial career first <laughs> and then go into politics or do something first or live or travel or do like, just do something other than be in politics first. Honestly, really? I, I really believe, like, I really believe if you don't have the empathy 
I, I, I usually say it like this because this is my life, right? Like, mm -hmm. look, I may be wearing a fancy dress, but sometimes the bill collectors be calling and I'll be like, okay, yeah, I'll pay it. I'll pay it on Tuesday. I know money ain't coming on Tuesday, <laughs> right? Unless you actually had a, done that in your life. Like, mm -hmm. unless you had to fan dangle the yeah. bill collect, you don't know how regular people live. Yeah. Right. So yeah. go out there and, and, and live a regular person life for five minutes, please, before mm -hmm. you go into politics and want to start writing leg legislation that's going to impact millions of people. You don't know one thing about regular person living and you want to go write legislation. <laughs> what? I think it's nuts. And I, I've always said that, especially around some people that I was working with. I was like, I wonder if he's ever gotten that phone call, you know? Hey, Selena, your bill is due. Oh, yeah, 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 I know. Oh, did I forget to pay it? You know, I'm going to pay it on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You oh, that's what I said last Tuesday? Oh, God, yes. No, but last Tuesday, I meant the next, next Tuesday. When I said yeah. next Tuesday, I meant this Tuesday, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think you make such a good point. Um, right. When we think about the people who are in our political spheres, and, and you talk about this in the book, you say there is, and there is, a culture of elitism, right? Mm -hmm. And we can say that this is white elitism. We know mm -hmm. that memory, many of our members of parliament, you know, grew up in political families, had resources, Perfect. had support, right? So in what way would they be able to empathize with those who do not have that as a life experience, who come from working class families or who had to make their way up or who were business owners or who had to take those phone calls? And, you know, I think that in a really incredible way, this year has sparked those conversations. Why is it that our political decision makers don't look like us and have not had the same struggles as the very people that they're representing. Right, and it's that empathy piece that I think is really important in this question. So, you know, and again, many people may not have to struggle. I'm not saying that everybody got that phone call or anybody has, everybody had to dumpster dive for their furniture. But, you know, when people say they wanna get into politics, I always say, why? You wanna get into politics because you like political procedure? Because you, rep you represent people, and I'm pretty sure the people you represent don't give a rat's tail about political procedure. So why are you there? Why are you there? What are you passionate about? Entrepreneurship will, will, will bring that out of you, right? It'll say, oh, I'm passionate about research. I'm passionate about business. I see a problem. I'm going to get into politics to help address this particular problem through legislation, through regulation, through policy. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, and then and you don't have the empathy that's required to represent, Whitby's a small town. It's one hundred and thirty thousand, right? And they're made up of a, a myriad of different people, different backgrounds, different races, religions, socioeconomic status. I need to really understand, at at least, be able to have the empathy and the understanding of what these people are going through mm -hmm. and how I'm able to help them with it. Yeah. And if you, if you're going in with this sort of either not a lot of experience with life <laughs> or a, a very privileged mm -hmm. ideology, you miss a lot of this, a lot of the stuff. And I, I'd have to say like, you know, I'm not saying this in the sense of, you know, I know that a lot of work is done by bureaucrats, right? And I'm not trying to diss bureaucrats in, in this analysis at all. But, you know, we need, even when the bureaucrats bring forward le pieces of legislation that fit the government agenda, you need sort of that political leadership that's going to say, hmm, I'm not really sure about that because I know based on my lived experience or based on the empathy gathered from talking to my constituents or talking to people in business or understanding X, Y, and Z, that this is not gonna work, mm -hmm. right? You need to be able to do that. And I think when we think about the 42nd parliament, there, there was one point where we did some small business tax changes. Mm -hmm. It was a national fiasco. Mm -hmm. And it was like, how did this happen, right? We have so many individuals that work who were small business owners, right? Mm -hmm. But 
unfortunately, the leadership did not consult, did not ask the questions. And I think when you are making decisions about going into politics, you really need to have that empathy. But when you think about, so the question was specific to um, persons of African descent getting into politics or a career in entre entrepreneurship, be yourself. Do not conform to any spaces that you are in as much as it's safe for you to do so. Okay, because some, some places it's not safe and, and that's okay. Especially with other intersecting identities, it's not safe. But be yourself. If you're going to go the road of entrepreneurship, whatever you do has to make you like Colgate smile every day. <laughs> like, like, what are you doing, son? I'm going to work. You look like you're in a Colgate commercial. Like, <laughs> You just smiling all the time, right? Like that is what I'm going to work. <laughs> when I was going to work, even though it was like downstairs and at my desk, I was like, yes, man, I got to get this clinical trial going. It's epilepsy. It's, you know, it's, it's Alzheimer's, it's Parkinson's, it's whatever. I'm loving it because I'm loving the challenge, right? If you're not doing that, if you're going to work like this, <laughs> that kind of call gate. Don't do it. And if you don't know what you're passionate about um, and you cannot show up as 100% authentic yourself as a person of African descent in politics, yeah. don't. Because representation matters. Mm -hmm. And in order for that representation to matter, something has to matter to you. You need to represent what matters to your people. Right. And often what matters to your people is going to be something that you've already experienced, mm -hmm. some hurt that you already understand. Mm -hmm. So bring that to the position, bring that passion to the position and you'll be great. And in fact, whoever anonymous is asking that question, the fact that you're asking it probably means that you want to run. Yeah. So hit me up. Let me run the campaign for you. <laughs> I love Let's that. do this. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, so we have a, a question from Brenda. Uh, so it's kind of a two part question. So how do you avoid burnout? Yeah. And, and, um, and especially, so I, I should have done this as a twofold, uh, especially when your professional life aligns with your passions, how do you maybe sometimes cut it off? Brenda wants me to save the world today. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a fair point because I'm, oh, I'm yeah, thinking yeah, from Brenda's perspective. Question. I'm going to have to like think about this one. But how do I, okay, so let me just answer the burnout thing first. Mm -hmm. How do I avoid burnout? Um, I didn't avoid burnout until I actually burnt out. And then I was like, oh, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> Um, I, I had a nervous breakdown in January of 2016 mm -hmm. and I was, um, I was scheduled to be an inpatient for four days. Yeah, I would never want that to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that on my worst enemy. It was a horrible, horrible state of being. And so I could tell you retrospectively how I should have avoided burnout and how I avoid it going forward. Um, because I learned the lesson. Number one, I, I have to say no. Yeah. That's easier said than done because I'm still yeah. saying yes to a lot of stuff. So like scratch that, that doesn't work either. Sometimes you just can't say no. Sometimes you like the money and the money's coming in and you just want to say yes, right? More, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just like more, more, more. Um, so, so first of all, I actually take a lot of time around self-care. And I talk about it in the book. And I learned this lesson from Michelle Obama. And when I met Michelle Obama, I reached out my hand to her. There's a, there's a funnier part to this story, but I'll just give you, I want people to buy the book. There is a hilarious part to the story, which I still, I'm, I'm like waiting for Michelle to like tell me that me and her are good. Cause yeah. <laughs> if I see her again and she's like you, <laughs> I'll be like, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Um, but when I did meet her, I said, you know, hello, Mrs. Obama, it's great to see you. I will not say what she said after that. But I noticed that her hands 
Like she had these like beautiful long fingers and her nails were so well manicured. And I looked at mine and they had like little chips in it. And I was just yeah. like, oh, how embarrassing. Like it was just like, oh my God. <laughs> you said, I can say it. <laughs> I, I take the time to manicure my nails at least every other day. It's me time. Short of holding a glass of wine, Brenda, there really <laughs> isn't anything that you could do with wet nails. Mom, can you, no, sorry, my nails are wet. In fact, my nail polish is right here. Um, Mom, babe, can you, no, sorry, my nails are wet. <laughs> it's me time. Like, honestly, it, even if you take that 15 minutes to just not think of anything mm -hmm. and just paint your nails. And look, if you're getting on my nerves, I put on more than one coat because one coat takes 15 minutes, two is half an hour. That's true. You don't want, if I'm, my husband usually says, if I see you're putting on more than one coat, I just know to stay out of her way, <laughs> right? Because I'm either mad or she needs some real me time. So yeah, so burnout, um, oh, when your professional life aligns with your passions, but do you get burnout with that? How do you shut it off? I think oh my God, I don't. Point. So maybe this is where I am right now. Because I'm passionate and I can't shut it off. I've mm -hmm. been in this dress. I said I wanted to change it, but my daughter was <laughs> tutoring in my room. I've been in this dress since 8.30 this morning doing like media and like, and I have not stopped. I haven't eaten. I just keep drinking this water and like taking little nibbles of stuff because, and I eat pine nuts. I keep pine nuts in my, don't ask. It's weird. Water and pine nuts. It's not sustainable, but I just love this. I love the journey I'm on with this book right now. And so Brenda, I actually don't have an answer for this question because I'm so loving it. But then I get up sometimes and my body is sore to the point where I need to take like two Motrin. So clearly I need to adjust something, Brenda, and I need to like say no. So what I told my daughter last night, because this is the second date, well, maybe like the second week in a row that I've been doing this, like and I have another event after this with the mayor of Stouffville, right? So I have another like two hour session after this. So I'm going to be in this dress for another two, two hours, hours, maybe three. So I told Desiree, I'm going to do a nine to five or a 12 to eight, right? So I'm going to actually set up a regular schedule. So I'm not going all day. Yeah. And then at least that way I could just take a break. So I think we, I think I just need to prioritize things a little bit differently and, and figure that out. But Brenda, honestly, I'm, I'm not there yet because I really, really love, I love the speaking. I love speaking about this book. I love how much people are resonating with the book. I love how people are saying they see themselves in it. So yeah, Brenda, sorry. Um, so I'm going to transition just for the last few moments um, before, before we conclude our time. Um, I'm just going to transition into a few questions that, that I had prepared for you. Yes. Um, so you alluded a little bit to it uh, in, in the presentation, um, but this year was a significant year, obviously for many reasons, um, our global pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I think for everyone and for Black people especially, it felt like this was the year that everyone woke up. And in, in interviews that you've done previously, um, you said that in 2018, it wasn't popular. It wasn't uh, really acceptable to talk about racism, especially yeah. um, as, a, as a parliamentarian and among your colleagues in the, in the Liberal Party. Um, so now that there has been that collective societal shift in attitude, what do you hope comes from that? Oh God, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a glass half empty kind of person. So this answer might not be what people want to hear, but honestly, like, we have been awake for a very long time. That's right. right? People just woke. They didn't even make the coffee yet. Uh -huh. Like how they've been woke for a while. Coffee is still not brewed. This, uh -huh. this is the kind of woke we're at right now, right? They, they haven't put on the eggs. 
They haven't put the toast on. There is nothing in the kitchen fry. Nothing is being made. Like this is the kind of woke state we're at. We just want to say we woke, but you ain't making no coffee. You ain't making no breakfast. Like, what do you mean you woke? You're supposed to do something after you wake up, uh-huh. right? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, right, Rebecca? That's we right. Know that. mm-hmm. So if you woke, where are the coffee at? Mm-hmm. Where are the eggs at? Where, where is the stuff that you are doing? Mm-hmm. Not you, it, It's not enough to have your eyes open and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that's what Black people go through. Well, good for you. I've known that for a long time. Uh-huh. Now get to work. So I hope to see, which I don't know if I'm going to see. This is the problem, right? Yeah. So, so all of a sudden the, the government... I'm going to talk to the government stuff because that's what I like to do. Government tables, Bill C-22, they're all of a sudden repealing mandatory minimums that they were supposed to repeal when they had a majority government in 2015. Mm -hmm. But they're doing it now. Should we start clapping, Rebecca? No, we shouldn't start clapping because it still has a lot of mandatory minimums on the books that are unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. You're going to put together a bill after you woke up that has no teeth? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to get me vexed. I already told you I have another event to go to, Rebecca. You don't want to make me vex now. No, no. Okay, next question then, because you're making me mad. I could keep oh, going on this one, but I won't, because I have to go to another. The poor mayor of Stouffville is going to be like, why is she so angry? Why is she, why is she so mad? Where did she come from? Why is she so mad? Yeah. I don't, um, I, think, I think we're, I think they woke, mm-hmm. but they aren't doing they, they're not making breakfast yet. That's all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, so we are almost at time. I want to make sure I'm respectful of your time and um, make sure that the mayor of Stouffville doesn't come after me for not being a, a prompt moderator. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for your time for your words, for your realness, like the authenticity. And it's been so long since I've, you know, heard someone tell it like it is, you know? I think there's so many moments where for the sake of politeness or not hurting people's feelings or being a stereotypical Canadian, um, we don't we don't tell the truth about what our realities are, you know, for fear of what the reactions will be. Um, and this was not that. There was no, no. fear tonight. <laughs> you don't invite me somewhere if you want that. Exactly. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I'd also like to thank everyone who came and who participated. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the Center for Employment Innovation, St. FX Discover Box, and the Office for Black Student Advising. We couldn't have done it without y'all. And we certainly couldn't have done it without you, Ms. Cesar Chavin, I read your book, so you know why I'm calling you by your full name. (laughs) Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone that participated. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for just this opportunity to share my love and my passion for the book and for my community. I ride for my community. That's why I will not ever half step from my community. So thank you all so much for the love and appreciation. I truly appreciate all of the support. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, bye everyone. Everyone be safe out there. (laughs) Bye Rebecca, thank you so much. You are phenomenal, loved it. Thank you so much, I'm glad.